prints. Now, this, this article was printed the 2nd of May, 2009. Mm. Before I do that, I do want to mention that um, I get a lot of questions. On the, I'm on the street a lot. A lot of questions about Haiti, and, and all I can say to you is we talked about the number 13 for years, and it happened on the 13th. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you see 13, mm -hmm. you should automatically know that that's the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. New information dealing with gold, and this is coming from a newspaper called Dominican Today, and it's, it says here, topic, a Canadian company to explore for gold in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Okay? Wow. Okay. Port-au-Prince. Now, this, this article was printed the 2nd of May, 2009. Mm. And it says, Port-au-Prince, a Montreal-based mining company, has announced plans to explore the mountains of northeastern Haiti for gold and copper. Wow. <clears throat> Magiscore, I think that's what it says, Resources Incorporated, will explore the site in a partnership with Simac Mining Holdings Incorporated, a Long Island, New York-based Consortium of Haitian American Investors. Uh, the same company uh, said the company is encouraged by explorers and Eurasians and, and minerals companies and so on and so on. Gold and copper were found in the Caribbean nations decades ago, but Haiti's instability and lack of infrastructure has have discouraged investment. A Barrick Gold Co Corporation site about 130 uh, 30 miles southeast of the Dominican Republic is estimated to contain 20 million ounces of gold. Mm. All right? So underground mining and explosions. All right? Gold is copper. Copper is going this way. So like I said before, save your pennies. Before 63 and after. Because 83. Um, yes, 83, right. The ones after 83 again has more zinc which is about 97% uh, and 3% copper. So it's still good for men, especially the zinc. You know, reverse the aging and the gray hair and all like that. Carry it in your pocket, touch it, whatever. But the ones before, pure copper. Save your pennies, you see it on the ground, don't step over it. Don't, don't dismiss it anymore because it's worth more than a penny. But understand, Haiti, for the tapes, when people get these tapes, Haiti uh, is dealing with mining and gold and things like that. Number 13. Mm -hmm. With that, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce this brother who is a good friend of mine. And uh, this brother is just powerful. And if you've seen any of his DVDs, you will know, uh, I'm pretty sure the reason why you're here is because you've seen some of his DVDs. Here he is, Prince, brother, Yuri Obey. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, a myriad of things today, um, which will deal with, of course, to a large extent, many of you who have seen uh, my tapes, uh, is dealing with law, um, language, um, and in particular today, uh, along with that will be um, inheritance. And uh, that is a, a topic or a subject that I find you know, many of us, uh, particularly in the Moorish circles, um, who at one time or another did deal with, uh, it seems um, have veered off or just forgotten about the issue or have been, uh, how can I say, they've, they've gotten sidetracked or whatever. Um, but um, it's important, it's imperative that for those of us in particular who are dealing with law, uh, nationality slash nobility, um, that we uh, take into consideration that there is no true nationality, no nobility, uh, and the exercise thereof or implementation thereof without fully comprehending or understanding uh, inheritance or inheritances, the law of inheritances, uh, appendages, and when I say appendages, dealing with inheritance, I'm talking about uh, not appendages, which of course is something that is added on to something else, but appendages specifically deal with inheritance. Uh, now, those of you who may have uh, attended um, uh, lectures with other speakers like uh, True Master, um, 
Brother Asir and others who have touched on aspects of the Holy Roman Empire uh, during the uh, Moorish Empire, or the rule of the Moors, um, that particular empire, also known as the uh, Sacrum Romanum Imperium, uh, dealt heavily with the science and laws of inheritance. In fact, uh, a little later what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go through a what is known as an imperial constitution, uh, which is patterned after uh, the ancient constitutions of the Holy Roman Empire, so as to give you a better idea as to how this uh, plays into the whole inheritance thing. Um, and also, I have to say that when we're talking about law and inheritance, um, it's important for us to understand um, time travel because there is no inheritance, uh, or again, the, um, the actualization of that inheritance without fully comprehending time travel, believe it or not. Um, and I'll simplify it just by saying that, um, so that it doesn't sound so abstract, that time travel as it relates to inheritance, of course, is dealing with lineage, bloodline, right? So when you trace yourself and you're, when we talk about our ancestors, um, from whatever school of thought we're coming from, basically this is what we're talking about. So um, again, so inheritance, birthright, etc., uh, and the exercise thereof. Um, and again, as I said, unfortunately, there's been very little, if any of that. Um, this will also uh, take us into the realm of uh, the court system, uh, some of the aspects dealing with courts, uh, in particular when they uh, bombard you with decrees of counsel. And when I say decrees of counsel, I'm talking about rules and regulations um, that are often thrust upon us. We find ourselves in these statutory, uh, illusionary, artifice uh, forums, as it were. And, um, and consequently, um, it creates a barrier uh, for many of us to, again, assert uh, our rights concerning inheritance, concerning the whole jurisdictional issue. Uh, I know many of you who have been doing research and listening to a lot of these tapes and things over the last year, few years uh, have come to know different things about the issue of uh, jurisdiction or judicature. And uh, judicature or jurisdiction, in simple terms, I mean, you can look it up in the Black's Law Dictionary or Bobier's or any of these others, and they'll give you a list of things pertaining to what jurisdiction is. You know, that uh, obviously, yes, dealing with authority, uh, so forth and so on, of different um, uh, boundaries, counties, countries, etc. But very simply, it means iuris, meaning right, uh, also dealing with law, and Diction, which of course deals with speech, or a right to speak. Very simple, right? Mm -hmm. So, therefore, um, to take it a step further, when we talk about right to speak, um, it's safe to say then that if we're talking about a right to speak, and if, say for example, an attorney, um, fiction of law, waxwork, mannequin, active hologram, whatever term or euphemism you want to use is again thrust upon you uh, by what they call the law of Ikra. Ikra, if you look it up in say the Black's Law Dictionary, in particular the uh, sixth edition or even I think the fourth or fifth, you will find that it deals with compulsion or forcing one or a group of ones to do something against their own inclinations or to commit illegal acts or incrimination, or to incriminate yourself in any way, shape, or form, or that they so see fit. So we want to be very careful of this. So anyway, uh, this dealing with um, right to speak, so therefore if, say, an attorney um, or some other said representative that the state forces upon you uh, is called your representative, or he introduces him or herself as a representative, well, how then can he be that, or they be that, if they don't, for example, speak your language? 
You follow? Me? So now when we talk about um, language or whatever your language might be, we're talking about self national expression. And unfortunately, we find that there's very little, if any, self national expression. And where there is no self national expression, there is no inheritance. There is no uh, right to speak, as it were, uh, and most certainly uh, there just are no rights, period, to be acknowledged. Um, so again, as I said, inheritance, right to speak, jurisdiction, um, and so if your particular language or tongue, or tone, and I'll get into that in a minute or two, uh, your tone is a unique one, uh, one of which is unique uh, to yourself and those like you, and again, one of which the attorney or whoever the representative is does not speak, then again, they cannot speak for you. Okay? Hmm, that's interesting. It right. Is. Yeah. It is. And, um, and so, therefore, um, I mean, you, you will even find, even for as corrupt as the, the courts are, you will find uh, situations where, say for example, uh, some of you may have seen it or experienced it, where an individual might be in the court of whom has been charged with something and does not speak, i.e. English, um, they will find an interpreter. And they will not proceed with that case uh, for the most part until they find an interpreter. And if your language is that unique, well, guess what? They can't really do much of anything until they find an interpreter. Um, and as the brother has stated, my language in particular uh, is Latin. Some refer to it as Moorish Latin. A more ancient name is Uranic or Admaurian. And, um, and anyway, so given that factor, um, no one therefore has a right to speak for me except for me or my chosen representative of my legation of my, say, organization that I might belong to, or uh, to take it a step further, the country to which my allegiance is pledged. And many people don't know or understand that when we talk about this, and as I mentioned, allegiance or national allegiance uh, that many people take lightly, um, believe it or not, it is something that can be used as a defense in any court of law in any country um, or any place on the planet, any place in the world, believe it or not. And one can recite, if you will, their National Pledge of Allegiance um, as, again, their defense and rest on that and say nothing else. See, one of the things that I found over the years uh, with a lot of Moors, not to say that none of what they have been doing isn't right, um, but they will oftentimes talk themselves, you know, into um, jail, prison, you know, or worse. And, um, and they can very simply uh, state their case by pledging their allegiance. Or, still, they can uh, recite or sing, if you will, their national anthem, whatever their national anthem might be. That's part of the science of national anthems. This is all dealing with time travel and inheritance, right? Because this is something that you inherit, if you will, from your ancestors or mayores. Mayores is, of course, the Latin or Moorish Latin for ancestors. Um, and in so doing, you therefore honor the ancestors, OK? So uh, these things are critically important. Uh, I dare say crucial and um, imperative, okay? Um, so, anyway, so as to not get too far away, when dealing with, uh, as I said, right to speak, jurisdiction, um, a lot of times we find that the attorneys will oftentimes, lawyers, want to have you, um, you know, plea or take a plea bargain or bar gain, as some may call it, uh, or gains of the bar, or members of and for the bar, um, <laughs> that um, they will 
have you take the plea bargain or trick you into it or con you into it or what have you, coerce you, um, so as to not have you go to trial um, because there's a, a, a chance, a slight chance that you might be acquitted, right? Um, but there's also a chance that you may not be, and that's largely due in part to uh, the forums and or venues that you find yourself in, which are typically, generally, uh, statutory venues uh, that deal with public policy, procedure, et cetera, that many of you are familiar with and know something about. Um, but suffice it to say, because they are you know, dealing with this in these uh, venues, uh, they deal with, say for example, if something do does go to trial, uh, they deal with what they call the jury of your peers, but of course it's not the jury of your peers. Uh, because we know a jury of your peers would be, of course, those like you, you know, that uh, share the same national interests uh, and or, if you will, of the same nationality. Now, many of us understand this concept of jury of your peers, um, but to make it more, um, how can I say, refined, is something known as, and you will also find this in many of your law dictionaries, uh, something known as a tongue or half-tongue jury. This is something that you will never, ever hear, uh, even in the circle of Moors. Okay? Um, a tongue or half-tongue jury deals specifically with all of the things that I just mentioned. Um, and more specifically, again, nobility, nationality. Why? Because it ensures impartiality. And because the juries that are typically used uh, against you, and uh, often, as I said, juries of whom are not your peers, um, that don't share the same uh, national origin, etc. And I'll even dare say, well, at least in my case, don't speak the same language, therefore it cannot be a jury of my peers. So therefore, I demand, or what they call postulo, a tongue or half-tongue jury. That uh, tongue jury, or half-tongue jury, um, is something known as a CISA, um, which is a Latin term. Uh, you'll also find a CIS, uh, a size, uh, a CISE, and it is a jury which is similar to uh, many juries that you find today, the 12 jurymen, etc., uh, made up of 12 uh, uh, men or women of a jury. But more specifically, it is a jury of 12 that are summoned uh, for the sole purpose of adjudicating, if you will, a case or a trying the disputes of a cause and um, arriving at a, at a decision, if you will, or I'll dare say ruling, um, based upon not so much evidence adduced, but, if you will, uh, an investigation that is conducted by the 12 jurymen or women, an investigation of, um, based upon their own investigation and knowledge. So again, they're not dealing with evidence, of course, that most juries deal with. And uh, these particular juries, again, under the heading or auspices of tongue or half-tongue jury, you can demand or select. And in fact, in the case of juries being stacked against you, um, of what they call jury of your peers, which are generally or typically uh, statutory persons, 1,400 persons and the like, um, these uh, juries, uh, as I said, of which are, um, of which are juries that, again, don't share any of the, uh, uh, the same markers uh, or national markers. Um, this tongue or half tongue jury is something of which you must demand. You have to demand a tongue or half tongue jury. It's vitally important. Vitally, vitally important. Um, and, uh, and as I said, this ASISA jury, coming under the heading of tongue or half tongue jury, um, is also a jury that uh, is reflective of particular writs 
legal writs that the defendant um, can use or utilize in that case. Okay? Those writs are, let me, before I go any further, if for any reason some of you are not with me or it sounds strange or you want me to repeat something or break it down even further, I'll be glad to do that, okay? Uh, and I know that typically there's usually like a question and answer portion of it, um, but more importantly, uh, I want you to really get uh, or fully comprehend everything that I'm saying, okay? So, uh, there it is. But anyway, uh, yes? Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be. The tongue or half tongue jury, um, exactly who will it consist of, and can I request more than that present state? Well, that's the whole science and nature of it, uh, in the question and nature of judicature, i.e. jurisdiction, is that you are, again, demanding, not asking for, um, or what well, do you think I can know? You're demanding a tongue or half-tongue jury respectfully, you know, right, but right. demanding it nonetheless as you have a right to, because you have a right to a jury trial, right? right. Um, of course, you know, you will find yourself in many statutory forums today uh, where they will tell you, well, um, there will be no jury trial, like, say, for example, housing court, or most administrative forums. A bench. Um, right, a, a bench trial and the like. But rest assured, or, um, or shall I say, make sure that you, I don't care what the forum is, um, that you always demand a tongue or have some, a tongue jury trial. And even though it may sound odd to them, that's neither here nor there because it's not about them, it's about you and your freedom, and you asserting or exercising your right or rights, okay? And in so doing, you then honor your ancestors, okay? Very important, um, because then this ties you into, or brings you back into, again, the whole issue of inheritance, right? Um, and let me just say this too, it, and one of the reasons why I touched on this whole language issue and tongue, half tongue, jury, and the like, is that um, it, it plays into the um, acceptance of that inheritance. In other words, there can be no inheritance uh, without a formal or proper acceptance of that inheritance. You have to actually make a formal acceptance of that inheritance. Those of you, or many of you, who, for example, may have come through the Morris Science Temple of America, um, and you've seen in the Constitution and Bylaws where it says that with us all members must proclaim their nationality, not that you should, not that you ought to, or that because you know the sun is out, it's a nice day, um, but that you must. And the same holds true with all of those uh, components or elements of nationality and the major one being inheritance and the exercise again thereof. And so there must be a proper uh, acceptance of that which is generally done orally or written via whatever language of that nation is. When you, you follow? When you make that too. <clears throat> when uh, you're claiming your nationality, mm -hmm. to whom and where are you making that too? Right. Well, to whom and where is um, governmental or government uh, forums. In other words, for all the world to see and know the truth to which shall never pass. You follow? So in other words, you're making a government record of it. Um, whether you're doing it on a county, state, or federal level, uh, whether you're doing it internationally, what have you. Um, and, and, and then, thereafter, um, acting it out. You follow? Because more importantly uh, than any of it is you acting upon these said promulgations, declarations, asseverations, and the like, okay? Would it have anything to do, uh, then it, it's not necessarily uh, important to go to, for example, Social Security office. Let's say you've become a Moorish American, you're claiming your nationality, you know, the whole thing, but under your Social Security statute, it says that you're black or Negro. Right. Or something like that. Now, do you go and change that, or when you when you uh, make your statement to the state and to the county, is that enough? Um, in some instances, it may be, and that depends on the individual. 
Um, and I say that only because, similar to like tax issues, you know, it doesn't, there, there's no one blanket thing, if you will, that applies to all, um, because it's like a case by case thing. But, uh, but for the most part, uh, you can do that with Social Security if you so desire, for those of whom are utilizing it. Um, uh, but for those who aren't, well, obviously there's no need. Well, I hope I've answered your question. No, you do. Okay, huh? Um, juries of your peers. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted a jury of my peers, I could pick 12 brothers that was bamboozled by the system, and they would be my uh, understanding. Right. Um, now, in theory, based on your logic, that makes perfect sense. Uh, but for what you are asserting in, in what would otherwise be an unfriendly forum and atmosphere, or hostile one, uh, which again, uh, prides itself on, as I mentioned earlier, the ICRA, you know, compulsory uh, acts of, of forcing one to do something against their will or incriminating themselves. So given that factor, um, we're talking about a jury of your peers, yes, but of the same national origin. And that must be, for lack of a better term, um, proven or established in such a way that they are of the same national origin. Uh, so that you will then again have a competent jury of your peers. You follow? And there must be some demonstration, you know, of this. Otherwise, it's, it's really a farce. You follow? Um, so, I'd ask you a question. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh-huh. And uh, on my first question, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. My first question is, how do you, um, how does a person um, become part of the Maori Science um, Temple or Nation or get nationalized? Mm -hmm. That's my first question. Right. My second question is, can um, people of the Maori Science Nation who know these, these nationality issues and the laws and statutes, um, can they um, um, counsel another person who, who hasn't gone through that yet in the court? Can they counsel? Can they act as a counselor? Okay, in answer to your first question, it's just a matter of showing up. Um, meaning, uh, as you alluded to, the Morris Science Temple of America, it's just a matter of going there. And, um, um, and proclaiming your nationality. Or, in other words, when you go there and you attend a meeting, or meetings, if you will, um, you tell them that you are here for the purpose of, you know, declaring or proclaiming your nationality, if you will. Um, and they are by right to issue you um, documentary evidence to the effect thereof, which is usually in the form of a nationality card. That's with the Moorish Science Temple of America. I can't necessarily speak on how it works with, say, for example, other Moorish factions, but for the most part, the principle is the same. And more importantly, the whole science of it is for the purpose of it being made public record, uh, for the simple reason that the Moorish Science Temple um, has been on public record for you know 80 plus years. So therefore, um, by uh, how can I say the, the logic then follows or should follow that its members therefore are on public record and are to be vouched for, you know, um, if any say incident, uh, legal or otherwise, may arise. Mm -hmm. You follow. Mm -hmm. um, now, as to the second part of that question, uh, if you can repeat it. Well, uh, before you repeat it, uh, we do have a brother, Sharif, coming in from the Morris Science Temple, and he'll be able to answer or, or take you through whatever you want to go through with that. Okay. And okay. second. Right. The second part of the question, if you can repeat it quickly. Please. Oh, no, I think you answered it. I, um, you, you said that by going there, they would vouch for you as a member of the um, Morris Science Temple of the same nationality. Right. Um, the second part of the question was, if, uh, for instance, if I um, had a, a court case or an appearance, had a summons to go and uh, had to appear, um, were, are there members, even though I'm not a Moorish, uh, I haven't gotten to that point yet, um, will they be, will, can I have somebody that will be able to represent me or counsel me, be my counsel instead of um, getting involved and uh, objecting to stuff I I don't I wouldn't even know what I'm objecting to like not having a lawyer right right um, well as is, is often said um, 
Wurbung sat sapientis, or word to the wise, and, um, and, and those are, how can I say, wise thoughts um, in your question form. And um, it's always important to have counsel, particularly if one feels that you know, they themselves are not versed or well versed in, say, areas of the law, or i.e. defending themselves or the like. Uh, and, and theoretically, this is how it's supposed to work if you are obviously a part, just like if you are a, a citizen of some said nation. You know, because uh, when we talk about members, we're talking about citizens of something, right? Uh, and so therefore, uh, there should always be a uh, legal counsel for that person, um, uh, whether it be in a, uh, an individual or a group of individuals that uh, represent this individual in these types of affairs, you know, these types of legal affairs. Um, now, I don't know, did I, did I answer that question? Did I answer your question? Um, you, you answered it to the degree where um, um, there will be some kind of legal counsel, but right. I, 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 right. You know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm still under their jurisdiction right. because I'm not a Moor. Well, right. So. Well, sadly, we find that a lot of Moors are still under the jurisdiction by virtue of um, because you're treated according to how you behave, mm. right? Wow. And so, if your behavior is that of, i.e., you know, Negro displaced person mm. or the like, well, then you're treated, <laughs> you know, accordingly. I mean, that's just universal, you know, law, principle, and the like. Um, so, therefore, one thing must be indicative or reflective of the other. Um, and as to, I think it was another part of the question where you said or asked, if, uh, say, a Moor or someone from any one of the Sith factions can represent someone of whom is not or has not proclaimed themselves to be a Moor, um, that's a very fine line, you know, and it's really a judgment call. It's not one that I would necessarily recommend, um, and it's not to say that it has not been done, but again, I would not strongly recommend it, but again, that's a judgment call for whatever individual or whatever given faction, group, organization, or the like. You understand? Um, so, um, anyway, as I said, all of these things are key components and elements of inheritance. Um, and when I say that, when I talked about the tongue, half-tongue jury, and stress the importance of language, this is generally or typically done through something known as cretiones. Cretiones only means, a, a, again, a formal acceptance of inheritance. Uh, let's not mistake this for cretin, which, of course, the, uh, the prefix of it is spelled the same. And as many of you know about Cretans, which is another word for Christian, not to insult anyone's beliefs or religion or anything like that, but by their own definition, uh, just and not to bear off, uh, Cretan means Christian and one of whom uh, has a series of congenital deficiencies or maladies, um, which culminate into something known as myxedema or myxedema hypothyroidism which is dealing with a blood and bone deficiency, uh, which basically is due to a uh, deficiency, if you will, of melanin, you know. Um, so are you saying only white people could be Christians? <laughs> uh, scientifically, <laughs> scientifically. Right. And if we're dealing with science, right. you follow? Yes. Then we're talking about uh, it from the perspective of, again, uh, what is charted in terms of electromagnetic spectrum, uh, dimensional separation, uh, genetic makeup, molecular structure, and the like. You follow? Uh, so, you know, if, say, for example, one, this is why, you know, religion by and large, and in particular Christianity, um, they're, they're based on what? Belief. You follow? As opposed to what is actual, factual, or truthful. Follow. So you can believe that you are all you want. It's like I can believe I'm 80 feet tall, but the reality is, you know, I'm not. You follow? <laughs> now, of course, we can get into semantics. Well, you know, based on one's perception or awareness, well, you are 80 feet tall, but that's another discussion. Uh, but anyway, um, so not really getting too deep into the whole um, uh, Mike's edema hypothyroidism, um, 
which basically is an underactive thyroid or a deficiency of iodine deficiency uh, or a lack of the particular hormones uh, tetraiodothyronine and triiodothyronine known as T3 or T4. Um, again, this is all relating to, again, inheritance, jurisdiction. Um, it's also dealing with, uh, well, as I said, the unique uh, issue of jurisdiction. Right. And you can actually prove jurisdiction or lack thereof based upon genetics. I mean, if you're that skilled, if you're skilled enough to do it and work your way back into the law and vice versa. You follow? Um, so, um, I, I'm smiling because I, I just love this, you know. I really, really, I really, really do. Um, and so, anyway, um, so we're talking about something also known as, and you'll often hear me go into these Latin terms, um, but eos e norma loquendi, which is the right and rule of speech. Again, right to speak. And the right and rule of speech, going back to the Aziza, which is dealing with, as I said, the, the 12 jurymen that you yourself will select um, specific onto your own um, national uh, makeup, if you will, um, also deals with a specific writ or kind of writ known as an Aziza writ, which is an ancient uh, writ or known as an ancient species of writ. Uh, species. Hence is where the term special comes from. So no one is really special. They are special. Uh -oh. And so the uh, ancient species of writ, also known as the Azisa, you follow? So you can see the correlation with the 12 jurymen, the half-tongue jury, tongue half-tongue jury, and all the, uh, uh, these other components, um, deal specifically with, believe it or not, has for its objects the right to determine uh, the possession of lands and um, the restoration of those lands. This is a writ dealing specifically with a type of jury on one hand and on the other something of which can be used in any and all instances much like the so-called habeas corpus uh, that you hear a lot about, or which is supposed to be the great writ and so forth, uh, which, as I stated, I think perhaps, well, on one of my other tapes or even one of my books, um, where I talked about habeas corpus actually as a misnomer, uh, what they call habeas corpus, uh, saying that you have the body. Um, and it's inaccurate or a misnomer because to say that you have the body is really an incomplete statement. If I said to you, you have the body, you would say to me, you have the body what? But if I said to you, produce the body, well, that says a lot more because it's of the imperative move, right? And it's an order. I'm ordering you. So what they say habeas corpus is, in the form of an order, is not really an order. It's, again, an incomplete statement. But if I said, produce corpus, produce the body, then again, that is an order, right? So, um... These things are very, very important. But anyway, as I said, this Assisa dealing with the restoration of lands or the possession of lands, again, deals specifically with the issue of inheritance. Mm -hmm. Right? But again, this is not really asserted or predicated enough because enough of us do not know about it. Or many of us who have bits and pieces of things you know, have, uh, if you will, the, the peripheral uh, information pertaining to it, and not necessarily the heart of it or the core, which is the key tone, okay? And tone, of course, again, dealing with tongue, right? Speech, right? And so when we understand the tone of it, then we understand time travel in its essence, which is really radio or radix or root emissions. This is what uh, so-called time is. Time, if you will, as I said, root of radio emissions, um, is also verbal tenses, right? When you learn languages, I don't care whatever language it was you learned in school, you dealt with conjugations, right? Conjugation is dealing with verbal tenses. And verbal tenses deal with conjuring things, or what they call tension, or temporal states of awareness, 
or in this case, temporal or continued states of awareness. Ah. And so when we understand this, then we understand what has happened in the whole science of geography. And if you don't understand geography or true geography, then you cannot make the accurate or, or, or necessary or proper claims, again, cretiones, to what that inheritance is, right? So when we understand or comprehend true geography, then we understand where things are placed, where the, they're actually placed, names, placement, and the like. And if we don't under, uh, understand this or comprehend this, then we're talking about displacement of those things. And a displacement of geographical uh, uh, names of places, countries, kingdoms, uh, dominions, empires, and the like, then we have temporal displacement in the mind. Hmm. Right? And the temporal displacement in the mind, dealing with, again, verbal displacement, means that, guess what? There's, there's, no, there's no dominion. There's clearly no inheritance. Because many of you have heard, uh, even those of you who are Bible scholars, where it talks about um, the... Um, how can I say, the power to name something is the power to have dominion, or the power, if you will, of potentiality to name something is the potentiality or potency to have dominion, okay? And so there's not enough naming going on. And you know why there's not any naming going on? Because it goes back to the heart of the issue, as I said, language or lingua. You follow? And once this is, is, is looked at, then you can begin naming things so that you don't have to go by, well, this is what it's known by throughout the world, or what, say, for example, the Europeans might call it, or uh, our curdled milk ones, or enchanted phantoms, or whatever you want to call them. But the point is, is that you are now naming things based upon your own, right, your own determination. You're making the determination of what it is, what it's called, where it is, and the like, geographically speaking. Okay, so when we uh, when we understand this or comprehend this, and we look at it, then we're talking about the true science of casting spells. And you've heard people talk about this time and again during lectures, you know, with the science of spells and spelling. But there can't really be any true casting if there's no true language that you identify with if you will, to call your own, and that you exhibit, you follow, in your day-to-day -day workings or how you live and whatever, particularly in these so-called legal forms, okay? Um, because, truth be told, with all of the issues that we're dealing with, many of which tie back into money, monetary issues, uh, economics, if you will, commerce and the like, all of these things, believe it or not, are rooted in land. And when we talk about land, again, we're talking about inheritance. You follow? Because he who what? Rules the land, makes the rules or the law or the like. You follow? So with this comprehension of inheritance and land and the like, um, and the assertion thereof, then you have a broader comprehension of commerce. Because commerce, uh, particularly when we're talking about commerce or the type of commerce that I refer to as somatology. Somatology commerce is dealing with the commerce of uh, uh, substance. In other words, like what the brother often talks about, gold, silver, copper, and the like, or these uh, natural minerals and ores uh, of the earth. Then we're talking about uh, the commerce of somatology. Well, as opposed to Vibgior, what is known as Vibgior spectrum analysis commerce which is based on speculation. And that's the commerce that you find yourselves, or many of us find ourselves in currently, okay, um, with the Federal Reserve note, and all of what you've come to know about the FRN, and the uh, commerce that mirrors it, you follow, or that is reflective of it. This is, again, spectrum analysis commerce, or kaleidoscope commerce, also known as uh, colorable. Commerce, right? Many of you know about colorable law and the like. Well, this is what we're talking about in what they call Vibgior commerce. So, somatology commerce, dealing with your gold and silver and copper and the like, 
is based on the ancient principles um, or what is known as the gold standard, right? Reflecting the moon and sun, you follow the other elements of the cosmos, okay? And we find this, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Moorish Treaty or the Moroccan Treaty um, of 1786, 1787, okay? This uh, uh, treaty, of which is still in force, but many of us, for whatever reason, seem to overlook that or don't have enough faith in it to uh, utilize it in these forums, uh, legal forums, because of the intimidation factor or whatever you want to, however you want to look at it. But this treaty, if the treaty is still in force, right, then, uh, which was made under the gold standard, then it's safe to say that this is a standard that you should be standing on under or however you want to look at it, but nonetheless, the standard by which you should be asserting whatever your said rights, tongue, nationality, nobility, and the like uh, is. Comprehend? Great. Good. So, um, as I said, so um, when we consider all of these things, um, we're talking about balance as opposed to imbalance. Um, we're talking about, as I said, uh, placement or proper displacement opposed to displacement, um, as I said, verbal tenses. Um, um, and then we are also talking about the four powers. The four powers are powers that involve language, or the use of language. Whatever that language might be unique to your own, again, national genetic molecular makeup. Um, and why I say this is the four powers um, are dealing with language one, two, the use of that language, three, how that language is to be spoken so as to be able to cast the right spell in whatever given situation at whatever given time, and four, um, how to express the subject involving whatever matter it is. You follow? Because ultimately when we talk about juries, and juries of which, again, are generally used against you, contrary to what we talked about with tongue, half-tongue jury, we are talking about, um, uh, how can I put it? Um, we're talking about juries that, that are, hmm, well, basically foreign, obviously, to yourself and to the jurisdiction to which you're claiming. And, um, and therefore, well, why would you want to be under a foreign jurisdiction or something, you know, foreign to yourself? Um, but there's another point that I wanted to make uh, regarding that, and that is that um, um, right that that when we're talking about this uh, uh, um, language and the proper placement, you know, of that language um, in these forums, whatever forums they might be, um, and we're talking about the four powers and how those powers would be used in those said jury trials, um, then we're talking about, ah, we're talking about um, sentencing, convictions, right, because individuals ultimately of whom are found guilty are convicted and they are sentenced. Right? Found guilty in a way. So, conviction is dealing with what? Language. I said something, I said it with conviction. Right? And if ultimately after the conviction I'm sentenced, then we're dealing with sentences. Sentence structure. Right? Uh, and, or a particular type of mathematics with that sentence or sentence structure. Um, and so, the convictions that are typically going on on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which goes back to the whole Cretanism thing, are essentially Christian convictions, or more accurately, damnations. This is what it's called, damnation. Whenever you're convicted, it's called damnation based upon a particular religious belief, though they, they, they <coughs> may call it or hide behind what they call law. Um, it's basically religion because it's based on belief. They presume something, right? 
and they assume or presume you to be guilty. Um, and so therefore, it's all based on belief. We know this based upon the current economic system, right? Or commercial commerce system, um, which is based upon, many of us have talked about it with the whole redemption thing, you know, creditor, debtor, right? We know that credit, right, as in credo, means belief. I believe, you believe, he, she, it believes, right? Which is an indicative active verb when we say credit. So therefore, if a so-called creditor says that you are a debtor or that you owe something, they're actually saying, based upon their own conviction, you know, finding you guilty, they're saying that you are one, insane, or out of your mind, right? Because to say you're a debtor is basically uh, the opposite of, well, what's the term or word for yes? The term or word for yes is sane or ita. Sane, S-A-N-E, sane. I'm sane, which means yes. So if, if I'm not sane, then therefore I must be insane. And insane Whoa. is no. <laughs> you follow? So that's why a debtor is often referred to as, within the inner circles, as Mr. and Mrs. No. Right? This is what the creditors refer to you as, Mr. and Mrs. No. And this goes into the area of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I know this sounds strange. I know it's like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But when I say Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I'm talking about something that deals with inheritance, believe it or not. Because if you look up the word hide, it has nothing to do with hide and go seek. They have us thinking or believing something or a definition of something based upon our current references or ill references, <coughs> right? Which is based upon our so-called uh, formal education or miseducation. So when we look at hide, in truth, hide means a measurement of land. Right. Hide also means noble or nobility. Again, inheritance, nationality, and the like. You follow? So we're talking about hide, or in uh, when they talk about uh, what's this other thing? Heide. As in the German, when they talk about Hansel and Gretel. Um, but anyway, hide or Heide, which as I said, deals with. Um, a measurement of land, also dealing with a place of a noble. Uh, we are therefore talking about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Because, and think about it now, many of us who grew up on these movies, whatever Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, whatever version, old or new, many of us were um, intrigued by the Hyde character more so than we were the scientist of Dr. Jekyll, because he was boring, right? Face it, you know. Yeah. We wanted to see the monster, right? Okay. So, uh, Hyde, believe it or not, we were intrigued with it for the simple reason that this character and the name more accurately spoke to your genetic makeup and the composition of your genetics. It was telling you something about the whole science and issue of inheritance. But that was layered over, you know, in this... Uh, uh, character in movie and fantasy and whatever. You follow? And this is why any one of you who are dealing with or thought to deal with the issue of hide, hideage, heidel, um, hence this is where the term Hildalgo comes from. Many of you who know something about history, um, whether you're talking about uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildalgo of 1848-1849, which was dealing with uh, uh, what now is called New Mexico, you know, and, and Arizona and, and California, and the gold rush, by no coincidence, all during that time, the Treaty of Hidalgo. Hidalgo, as I said, of course, high dealing with measurements of land, hello, and algo, as in the Spanish, Hidalgo, deals with nobility. De buenas lugares, a man of a particular or good situation, and algo dealing with land or property, right? So, uh, anyway, as I said, those of you who are dealing with this issue or attempting to deal with this issue are thought to be troublemakers, right? Um, impeders, 
those who impede, as in the devil's imps, i.e. infidel, because infidel is just another word for devil, or those who don't uh, ascribe to our belief or our way of doing things, or our rule, if you will, okay? So again, we're talking about those who impede, uh, or if you will, those, and when I talk about impeders, we're talking about another term for impeder, believe it or not, hence is why the campaign for so long with the Michael Jacksons and, and uh, other individuals have been labeled as pedophiles. Hello. You follow? So if they can put any Asiatic melanin dominant individual as poster boy or woman or girl or whatever for pedophiles, you follow? And again, this is the face of it. Then obviously one makes the association in the legal arena with you when you step forward with the issues of heightage and land and measurement and nobility and the like, right? Because you are now impeding the prime objective or whatever their objective is or their life file or germ file or, or, or <coughs> pill file, hence is where the term pilgrim comes from, germ file, okay? Um, and so therefore, <laughs> therefore, um, and, and conversely, I must say, that anyone amongst you who don't know or have any idea of these heightage, nobility, land issues are thought to be displaced persons or Negroes. So now, which is it? You follow? So, um, and I know I went in a roundabout way to get to the point, but my whole thing here is connecting the dots. You follow? So that you can see, you know, oh, okay, that makes sense. That goes with that. That goes with that. Oh, oh it's all dealing with inheritance. The very thing that they try to, um, again, uh, uh, they try to cloak or, you know, they, they try to hide or cover over. And we find this again with the layers and layers and layers of law, colorable law, again, kaleidoscope commerce, okay? Uh, and there would be economic system. You follow? So now, and just for the record, uh, and so that I don't, don't lose trend of thought, just for the record, when we talk about, and I know I'm talking fast, so forgive me, but it's on tape. So, but anyway, um, when we talk about economics, or true economics, like I said, true geography, we went through that, and the placement of things, as opposed to displacement and the like, based on language and all of that. Well, anyway, true economics is, well, for example, in school, uh, high school, college, whatever, for those of you who learn whatever aspect of economics that you learn, and as is applied, supposedly throughout uh, the, the society here. What is the definition, I don't care who tells me, but what is the definition of economics as was taught to you? Supply and demand. Supply and demand, okay. Can you expound or expatiate further, anyone? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go get, go get a good job, I mean, get a good education to get a good job. Right, right, right. Pay your right. taxes. Pay your taxes. Right, right, <laughs> okay. right, right, right. Okay, very good, very good. Oh, um, I think another, another term they teach you, it has to do with resources. I mean, the real older schools, uh, when they taught economics in the right. earlier days, it had to do with, they said, resources. Right, well, yeah. it does. And today we find, um, we find a contradiction or a paradox, if you will, of sorts, um, because it's dealing with resources, because obviously we're talking about groups of individuals, people who rule the world via economics and um, sadly uh, uh, control the resources of the world as well. Um, but when we talk about economics and, the, and true economics by its true definition, as opposed to what you learned in school, they taught you in school, and I know this is going to ring a bell, when they said, um, the rise in the level of prices related to an increase in the volume of credit resulting in the loss of value of currency. Right? Right. right. Well, okay, that sounds good. There's only one thing that they left out. So for the most part, it's accurate. But they left out the most key uh, uh, por part or portion. And that is, um, it is whenever there's an increase in the in the demand right um, without or demand and supply or supply and demand without a corresponding increase in the gold and silver backing then inflation occurs 
Brother, with that, let me get you to pause for like 15 As seconds. As a matter of fact, need I was asked to repeat what I had mentioned earlier about Haiti. Uh, of course, the 13th, it happened on the 13th, which is dealing with the number 13. And you can go back and get numerous lectures where we broke down the number 13. Actually, there's a good book out by Stuart Swerdlow called 13 Cubed.